the initial gold strikes in 1848 and the gold rush in the years after initiated a pattern that begins our settlement of the Far West. There were a whole series of these strikes in different regions across the West. Uh, 1858 in Pikes Peak in Colorado, uh, a huge strike was discovered. In the spring of 1859, the famous Comstock Lode was struck in western Nevada. Other discoveries followed in places like Idaho and Montana, in the Dakotas, uh, and in 1874, a little town called Deadwood sprung up as a result of one of these strikes. The process is similar in each of these instances. Uh, a, an initial discovery sets off a wave of excitement, and hundreds and thousands of people flood from all across the country to reach the spot where the strike was discovered. This would result in a boomtown economy. Uh, for men, there are opportunities as saloon owners, prospectors, miners, and other sorts of laborers. Women follow as well as dancers or prostitutes or wives of those who are heading to the West. Towns rise and fall as the uh, discoveries are consumed and the environment in some cases is returned back to itself in the form of ghost towns. Places like Oregon and Washington in the far west are settled as well, although not directly in response to gold or silver strikes in those regions. We might again think about our sports mascots as a guide. We think about, well, the Oregon Ducks doesn't really apply so much, but the Oregon State Beavers provides us a clue. And also we might find a clue in the Stanford University mascot, the pine tree, which is always sort of an odd sports mascot. But what we find in places like Oregon and Washington are natural resources, raw supplies that might have been scarce in other parts of the West, particularly lumber and timber. Uh, we think about the lush green regions of the Pacific Northwest, uh, wielding in some cases giant trees like the redwood trees of Northern California. And these sorts of things would have provided much needed resources for those who were prospecting for gold and other sorts of ore across the West. And so if we look at the map on the right, we see during this period that places like Oregon and Washington also develop a sizable and steady population, even if it's not directly in the quest for gold. The growing number of settlers in the Far West set off a dramatically heightened desire to communicate more quickly and readily and for transportation that could move settlers and prospectors more quickly across the West. And so there's another sort of entrepreneurship that springs up around this need to communicate and to move across the West. Now, there are many examples of this, but to mention just a couple of them, John Butterfield established a fleet of some 200 stagecoaches. Uh, you see a picture of an example of these at the top, uh, which could ferry settlers across the West uh, more quickly and safely than had been done before. And these stagecoaches remain a popular tourist attraction. If you travel to many sites in the West, you have an opportunity to ride on one of these Butterfield coaches. Perhaps more famous still is the Pony Express, established in 1860 by William H. Russell. Russell's plan was a simple but ingenious one. He established 190 way stations placed at 10-mile intervals all the way across the West, spanning some 1,900 miles across the West. Thereby, the rider could hop on a, a horse and gallop at full speed for 10 miles to the next stop, and then hop onto a fresh horse uh, 
and continue on the journey to the next stop and the next and so on, uh, occasionally changing riders as well as horses. For all its fame and notoriety, the Pony Express was active only for 19 months and compared to modern forms of transportation, it wasn't especially quick. The very fastest journey of the Pony Express was seven days and 17 hours. And this was in delivering Lincoln's inaugural address to those in California. But it was, as I say, short-lived. In October of 1861, the Pony Express was rendered obsolete by the successful laying of the first transcontinental telegraph line, which allowed people to now send messages back and forth from east to west and back almost instantaneously. The real driver of this trans transportation revolution in the west was the railroads. And you see in the chart there on the right, that eventually there will be uh, half a dozen or more rail lines connecting east and west. But there was a great interest in speeding the process of moving back and forth across the country. One of the most famous tales from this era is the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, which we will discuss more in just a moment. In 1861, you might notice on your map the little spur on the far west coast, right there in the center of California, connecting the coast with the city of Sacramento. This was the Central Pacific Railroad, which was established by four California merchants in 1861, among them Leland Stanford, who would later establish the famous Stanford University. This was the Central Pacific Railroad, which began building out from Sacramento to the east across Nevada. And you can see the line there on your map. In the meantime, building from the east to the west was the Union Pacific Line, springing out from Omaha, Nebraska, and building to the west. The construction of the Transcontinental Railroad is one of the most famed in all of the West. Uh, there are many tales of uh, great and arduous and heroic deeds done in building this railroad. By far, the greater difficulties confronted the Central Pacific. And if any of you have been to that part of California or learned much about it, you would be familiar that the northern parts of California are very mountainous. And as you stretch out into Nevada, uh, it is rocky and mountainous and dry, and then eventually spreads out into desert. This is the kind of terrain that the Transcontinental Railroad had to build across. And the engineer in charge of this remarkable task was named Charles Crocker, a name that we will hear a couple of different times during these lectures. But Charles Crocker oversaw this remarkable building effort, sometimes moving forward at a pace of only inches a day as his workers blasted through the sides of mountains or cut their way over and around the mountains on their way out to the east. The conditions were extremely hazardous in this job and dozens of workers died during the course of building the Central Pacific Railroad. The process for the Union Pacific coming from the east was quite a bit easier and smoother. The Union Pacific at its height was able to, to lay as much as 10 miles of line a day. At the end of the line was a huge, moving, migrating city, which provided housing for thousands of workers and also entertainment as well. And so it's this giant tent city, uh, hundreds of tents, including saloons and brothels and all kinds of entertainment as this uh, Union Pacific made its way across the West. The two different lines built in their directions approaching each other until the infamous moment on May 10th, 1869, when the two lines connected 
just east of the Great Salt Lake in Utah at a place called Promontory Point. And you see the famous picture there below on your left as the two lines finally connected and they laid the famous golden spike to commemorate the moment. Uh, we have now achieved a direct rail line all the way across the country from east all the way to the Pacific Ocean. But if you notice again on your map, this was merely the first, and within just a handful of years, there would be other lines to the far north, to the far south, and several different places in between, so that gradually the nation is becoming connected by an entire network of railroads. As the gold prospectors and others begin to fill up the far west, and as the railroads begin making their way across the west, creating this network or grid, allowing settlers to move to the west, there becomes also a greater interest in settling the vast and largely desolate regions in between, in between California and the east. These are known as the Great Plains. And as the picture you see suggests, for great stretches of the Great Plains, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of square miles, there isn't very much there. And so the prospect of settling in these regions would have been a daunting one. And yet we see thousands, tens of thousands of people coming from the east and moving into these desolate stretches in the west. So we might ask ourselves, what would entice someone to leave uh, the east and move out to the west. There are a number of reasons that you see on the list here, and I'll mention just a few. For one thing, lands in the east, the actual dirt and soil was actually getting tired. If we think about many stretches in the east had been settled for hundreds of years and farmed for hundreds of years, and so the soil was not as rich as it once had been. Meantime, the soils across the Great Plains have been untilled for all eternity. And so what the settlers find as they move into the Great Plains is that the soil is incredibly rich and leads to robust crops. A second inducement was that the cities in the east were booming. We will discuss urbanization and the rise of cities in a future chapter. Uh, they certainly bring with them a sign of progress and a sense of excitement. But there are also many negatives to the cities. And a lot of people began to find the cities very trying. And they would prefer a simpler and quieter lifestyle out there on the plains. Uh, we might also remind ourselves that many of the immigrants arriving in the country were farmers in the old country. And so living in a very dense city was not something they were accustomed to anyway. But the cities, for all of the positive things they presented, they also presented issues like crime, alcoholism, violence, and also the growing prominence of inner city politics, which might sound like uh, not too much of an issue for us today. But remember that in this era, inner city politics frequently involved much knocking on doors and wrangling with people, uh, twisting of arms, and in frequent cases, violence to get people to vote for the candidate at hand. There were also, at times, limited opportunities in the East. Now, this might change depending on how the economy was going, but when we consider, as one example, the Panic of 1873, which I mentioned in the previous lecture, the economy, economy in the East plummeted, and jobs were suddenly scarce. And so an event like that might lead thousands of people to head out to the West. Many of the immigrants uh, moving out to the West were immigrants arriving from Europe. And as I've suggested, back in their homelands of Ireland and Germany and the central parts of Europe and Italy, they were farmers. And so when they arrived here in the United States, uh, they might prefer not to live in one of the big cities in the East or Midwest. Uh, 
and rather find themselves a farm out in the West. And a final group that might have found this movement to the West desirable were blacks coming from the South. We talked in the previous chapter about the prospect of the freedmen and how difficult things were in the South. Now, most of them wound up stuck on the sharecrop farms in the South, but uh, growing numbers were able to move out for one reason or another, and we see several thousand of them making their way out to the West to, in fact, find land and a home and a farm for themselves. While there were many push factors driving and encouraging people to leave the East and head West, there was also a powerful pull factor or enticement. And that comes in the form of the Homestead Act of 1862. Under this act, any citizen over the age of 21 years old could claim up to 160 acres of public domain. All they had to do was live on this land for five years, develop it, that is, build a house and start growing crops and so on, and survive for five years, and then this plot would be yours to keep. This was a powerful inducement, and thousands of people began heading out to the West under this Homestead Act of 1862. The government, of course, had a, a powerful interest in seeing the middle part of the country settled and filled up. It would not do to have a vast expanse of empty territory between California and the East, and so the government encourages settlement through this act. What we see in these pictures are what some of these homesteaders would have looked like. In fact, the picture there in the center is actually the very first Homesteader. This picture was taken years later as he's getting up in years. Years, Nonetheless, he looks like a tough customer, does he not? He is heavily armed. Four or five different weapons that we can readily see, including the rifle there in his hand, a hatchet tucked into his belt, and a knife dangling there uh, in front of him. Uh, this is the sort of person who settles in the Great Plains. You get a sense merely from the look on his face. Tough, rugged, independent. Remember, though, these folks had to make it on their own. There was very little infrastructure or support mechanism to help them. The chart there at the right gives us a sense of what this five-year process might have looked like. And we can see there from the first year or two at the top, relatively little there, uh, just a, almost a hole in the ground and a few things going on until eventually towards year four and five, we have some more permanent structures, a nice home, and fairly expansive fields. What we will find is the process was rarely so easy for these homesteaders. <laughs> 